This is Coding Math, episode 52, Pseudorandom Number Generators, part 2. In part 1 of this series, we covered what a pseudorandom number generator is and looked at a couple different algorithms for creating pseudorandom number generators, or PRNGs. Hopefully, I managed to get across that the two algorithms we looked at were not the best out there, but because they are so simple, they're good to use for demonstration purposes. However, I will say that the last iteration we looked at, the linear congruential generator, with the parameters from the Numerical Recipes book, is a worthy candidate if you want to create a simple, fast, lightweight PRNG in just a few lines of code. In fact, here you can see a simple library I made with it. I've included various useful methods such as nextfloat, nextbool, functions for getting numbers within certain ranges, and even a random color function. Feel free to use it, copy pieces of it, or build on it. Another fun fact is that, to this day, Java's default random number generator uses the LCG algorithm with its own set of parameters. Depending on how you feel about Java, that could be a major selling point for the algorithm, or the final nail in its coffin. At any rate, at some point you may find the need for something more robust. There are all kinds of other algorithms out there, and it seems like someone is always working on an even better one. You can do the research yourself and create your own, or find one to port over from another language, or the most pragmatic approach, use one that someone has already made for the language you're using. Not surprisingly, there are plenty of existing PRNGs in JavaScript. Now, one of the most popular high-quality PRNGs is called the Mersenne Twister. This was developed in 1997 and has become the default generator used in many languages and programs. In those where it's not the default, you can usually find a third-party implementation of it. In fact, if you search Mersenne Twister JavaScript, there are quite a few hits. To test the quality of PRNGs, there's a set of tests called the Die Hard Tests. The Mersenne Twister passes all of them. The default implementation is not totally suitable for cryptographic purposes, but there are implementations that address this. Of course, with the added quality comes the fact that it's a much more complex algorithm. It uses more memory and is slower than other algorithms. Let's get a feel for using one of the JavaScript versions of this algorithm. I'll just go to the first result here. Looking through it, we see that this is the core code that generates a new pseudorandom number. Feel free to step through this and try to figure out what's going on if you want. I'm not going to go through it in this video. Now this is a GitHub gist, so I've just downloaded the code and put it on my own server. I'm starting with a fresh JS bin, and in the HTML I'm just adding a script tag with the source attribute set to the script that I just saved. To use this particular library, you have to create a new instance of the Mersenne Twister class. I'll save that as MT. By default, it's automatically seeded using the current time. To get a random floating point value, I can call mt.random. I'll just create a for loop and log 10 iterations of it. You see that each time I run this, I get different values. So let's give it an explicit seed. For this library, we set the seed with init genrand, passing in the seed. Now multiple runs produce the same numbers. To generate integers, we can say genrand int32. You might notice that this code is directly ported from a C implementation, so the naming conventions are a bit different than what we're used to in JavaScript. Now there are a few other methods on this particular class that differ slightly in what they produce, but for the most part, that's what you get here. Now of course the Mersa and Twister is not the only game in town. Let's look at some others. If you search for PRNGs in JavaScript, one of the first you'll find is probably going to be David Bao's Seed Random. We'll take a look at that. This one offers a nice CDN URL to use, which is always nice. I'll copy that and paste it in over the Mersen link. The way seed random works is by taking over the default math random method in JavaScript. I'll get rid of the Mersen stuff here, and inside the for loop, I'll just call math random. And of course, we get random floating point numbers. Right now, we're still using the built in math random. But if I call math seed random, passing in a seed, now, math random is a high quality seeded PRNG, giving us the same numbers each time. Personally, I'm not crazy about this implementation. I like to know that if I see math random in code, it's the original math random. And if I'm using something else, it's obvious that I'm using something else. To accomplish that, we can call new math seed random, passing in a seed and storing the result in a variable. This leaves the original math random function intact. And as you can see here, we're back to non seeded random numbers. Now our PRNG is stored in the variable random. 
To generate a float with this PRNG, I just call it as a function, random. And we're back to seeded values. If I want integers, I can call random.int32. Now note that this returns signed integers, which include negative values, a bit different than the other PRNGs we looked at. Just something to be aware of. Now seed random uses a PRNG called ARC4, or ARC4. This was originally developed for cryptography purposes, but vulnerabilities were later discovered, rendering it insecure for that use. But it's still a decent enough PRNG algorithm. The GitHub repo for seed random also contains some other PRNG algorithms that you might want to check out as well. And there are plenty of other libraries out there for you to investigate. As you've seen, they all vary somewhat on how they're instantiated and the methods used to seed them and get various types of random numbers, but generally they all function in a similar enough manner. So now that you have so many options for creating random numbers, we come back to one of the earlier questions. Why are these better than math random? Now originally I said that one of the key benefits was the ability to see to PRNG, which you can't do with math random, and I gave a couple brush off examples, so let's explore that a bit more. First off, I've made numerous references to cryptography in PRNGs. Let's take a brief look at how that works. Realize that what we're about to do here is an extremely simplified cryptography example, just to give you an idea of how the process works. Let's say that I have a message that I want to send to someone. I'll make a variable and write the message, hello world123, and I can log that and no surprises there. But I don't want anyone else who might happen to intercept the message to be able to read it, so I can encode it in some way. You might have done this as a kid with a simple substitution cipher. Each letter in the message is replaced with some other letter. Your friend knows the code and can decode the message by applying the same process in reverse. This is super easy to do in code. I'm making an encode function here that takes a message and an offset. I'll create an empty result string and then loop through the message, getting the character code for each character. I can then add the offset to that code and convert it back into a character by saying string from char code and add that to the result string finally returning that string. Now I can say encoded equals encode message five. And I'll log that. Looks like random characters. Now I can copy and paste this whole encode function and call it decode. All I have to do is change this plus to minus and I have a decoder. I say decoded equals decode encoded five. Log that. And I've encoded and decoded the message. So now, unless someone knows what offset to use, they'll never know what I wrote. Hmm, yeah, sure. Actually, ciphers like this are super easy to figure out, even without computers. In fact, they use as casual puzzles in newspapers. In this case, all the E's become J's, all the L's become Q's, all the spaces are percent signs, etc. So with a little logic and a bit of trial and error, you can always figure these things out. But what if we used a different offset for each character? and each offset was randomly chosen. That would be pretty hard to figure out. But in order to decode it, the recipient would have to have the same list of random numbers that was used to encode it. In the old days, that's exactly what would happen. Each user would have an identical pad of paper. Each page of the pad would have a long list of random numbers used to encode and decode the messages. After a single use, that page would be destroyed. These were known as one-time pads. But with computers, we can replace the pad full of numbers with a PRNG. Each user just needs to know the seed. In the encode function, I'll change offset to seed. And I'll create a PRNG with seed random and that seed. Now, instead of adding a single offset value as we loop through the message, I'll add random int32. And I'll make the same changes in decode. Now I'll just run this again. Because the int32 method returns a signed 32-bit integer, we're getting into all kinds of odd Unicode characters, mostly Chinese stuff, but some other weird symbols as well. Usually, the random values would be modded into a smaller range of values. Nevertheless, when we use the same key to decode it, we get back the exact original message. Also notice that for identical characters in the source message, completely different characters are used in the encoded message, so there's no pattern to be distinguished here. Now this is what's known as symmetry key cryptography, because both users need the same key. Sadly, as I've said, most PRNGs are not actually suitable for such purposes. This is because even with high-quality generators like the Mersenne Twister, 
it's possible to analyze or reverse engineer the output and crack the messages. Special cryptographically secure PRNGs, or CSPRNGs, should be used for any kind of serious encryption. Now, chances are you're not writing your own cryptography system anyway. So let's look at some other examples of where you might use PRNGs. One I already mentioned is games. When you're creating game levels, you have many choices to make. One is whether each level is, should be created by hand or is going to be generated by an algorithm. Say a landscape, for example. I could go in and write out the numbers that would create a landscape, the mountains and valleys, etc. Or I could let some kind of random number generator do it for me. I've got a canvas on the stage here, and I'm just going to loop through on X from 0 to the size of the canvas, 600, and draw a line to a randomly chosen point on the Y axis. There you go. Not a very elaborate landscape, but it'll do for demonstration purposes. Now I'll copy this loop and put it down here a couple more times. And I'll change the base Y value for each time. Now this represents the same landscape for multiple plays of the same level. As it stands, each time the user returns to this level, he gets a different landscape. Because it's random. Okay, there are plenty of games that work just like that. It's not necessarily a good or a bad thing, it's just a choice you have to make for your game. Do you want each level to be exactly the same each time any user enters it? Or is it okay if it's totally different? Without a seeded PRNG, you'd have to define the level by hand, or maybe randomly generate it and then store the random values along with your game, if you wanted it to be the same each time. But with a PRNG, you only need to store the seed for each level, and that will ensure that each level will appear the same to all users every time. You can apply this to all varying aspects of your game. How many bad guys there are, when they come out, where they come from, how strong they are, etc. Now another example I mentioned is generative art, or creative coding. Say I wanted to randomly place a bunch of shapes, say circles of random sizes. I'll just whip up a quick for loop here. And each iteration will create a random X, a random Y, and a random radius. And it'll draw a circle using those parameters. Now every time we run this, we get a random arrangement. But say I'm going along and I get to an arrangement I like. But I want to change the color a bit. Well, I'm kind of screwed because I have no clue what values resulted in this picture. If I change the color to a different darker red and rerun it, that nice arrangement I had is gone and lost forever. But say I change the code to use a seeded PRNG. Now I can try different arrangements by changing the seed. Okay, I like this one. But maybe it would look better with a bit of blue. I'll change the color. Same arrangement, new color. I can try various colors and never lose that random arrangement. Another trick with this one. Say I wanted to add a bunch of other objects on top of what I've already got here. I want another layer of circles, all in the same position, but with a different color and slightly smaller radii. Well, I duplicate the loop. Change the color. Make the radius a bit smaller. And of course, that gives me a whole bunch of new random circles, different colors, different locations, different sizes. But if I reset the seed before the second loop, now I get a really neat effect. Because we reseeded the PRNG, we get the same list of random values, and our new circles overlay the old ones exactly. Of course, you could do the same thing by storing all the values in an array in the first loop, and then going through that array again. It's not that a seeded PRNG does anything that would otherwise be impossible, but it sure makes things easier. So I hope this rounds out your basic knowledge of pseudo-random number generators. Naturally, there's a lot more to explore on the subject, but over to you to do that exploring.